Sam Harkness was 13 years old when his mother left one day, leaving no note, no forwarding address, no information on where she was going. Sam and his brothers were then left with the question of not only why, but also where and how. The telling of Sam's story is all the more remarkable because Sam's half-brother, Reed Harkness, made a series of films about Sam's antics while he was a child and an adolescent. The film Sam Now beautifully intercuts this footage of Sam the child with Sam the adult on a journey to find his mother and the far more complex journey of what to do when he finally finds her. It's the story of complex and difficult personalities in a family, how they affect everyone, the challenges in balancing empathy, compassion, boundaries, and reality, and how healing is a process of evolution. This podcast should not be used as a substitute for medical or mental health advice. Individuals are advised to seek independent medical advice, counseling, and or therapy from a healthcare professional with respect to any medical condition, mental health issue, or health inquiry, including matters discussed on this podcast. The views and opinions expressed are solely those of the podcast author or individuals participating in the podcast and do not represent the opinions of Red Table Talk Productions, iHeartMedia, or their employees. So Sam and Reed, welcome to Navigating Narcissism. Your film is one of those films I call sort of a film that sticks to the hippocampus. You can't quite shake it. It's so visually beautiful. It's a richly told story. It is such a unique use of footage. I can't wait till everyone in the world can see this film because it is actually one of the more beautiful, evocative films I've seen. Your dream is a psychologist's dream. So thank you for bringing your art into the world. It's wonderful. To our listeners, Sam and Reed are brothers. Sam is the subject of this film. Reed is the filmmaker. And what's stunning about the film is it stitches together 25 years of home videos Reed shot of Sam. And their film, Sam Now, is really a movie about love. It's about longing. It's about loss. It's about family. And it's also about intergenerational issues within a family and understanding how the trauma and loss of one generation pays forward into another and how it impacts them. So that's my take on it, my shrinky take. I would love to hear from both of you. Tell us, please, a little bit about the film. Thank you so much for that intro. This is a film I started when I was a teenager and I persisted for for 25 years. And the reason why is because I was really interested in some characteristics about my little brother. He's my half brother and this sort of resilient attitude he had. He, was, he would always take falls, but then bounce right back up, which is not something I naturally do. So I kept filming him over the years and started to learn more about him and see this kid kind of grow up. At this point that we bring up making a film about Sam's missing mother, my stepmother, she disappeared one day from our family without telling anyone. This is a shock to the family. Nobody expects it. And eventually the police are contacted and weeks later, a missing persons detective gets back to our family and says, we found her, she's not being held against her will and she doesn't want to talk to any of you. So we're left with that for the next three years and It's a really awkward thing in the family. The adults don't seem to know what to do. And our brother Jared is very depressed and is dropping out of school. And there's not much support for Sam either. So it becomes a strange thing where I find as the older brother that I should get involved. Can I ask you, Sam, and I think listeners almost need a moment to take this in. You basically one day your mother disappeared. And then not only do you find out that it wasn't an accident or something like that, but that she's very much alive and doesn't want to talk to you. This is so many layered losses that for many people, it's incomprehensible. Interestingly, the story of the father leaving is one that I don't want to say quite normalized, but it's definitely 
sort of steeped in the culture. The idea of a mother leaving is a very rare and anomalous experience. And so, Sam, how old were you at the time your mother left? It was right when I was entering high school. So right before my freshman year. Maybe it was 13, yeah. <laughs> okay, so 13. The reason I want to know the age is that that's actually a pretty significant juncture, right? This is sort of now a boy, girl, anyone is in puberty and coming out of puberty into adolescence. And so it's there's a lot. There's a lot happening even on a good day for the average 13-year-old boy, let alone now you're a 13-year-old boy about to go to high school and your mother has disappeared. Is Jared younger than you or older than you? Older by two and a half years. So Jared's an adolescent. You're coming into adolescence and now your mom is gone. So before we get to that, what was your relationship like with your mom when she was still there and you were living with her? Yeah. So firstly, my parents were divorced. Mm -hmm. And so it was a very, I think, typical split time. The custody between the two parents was every other weekend and a couple weekdays at my mom's house. And I think we had a close relationship. I think I was closer with my dad solely because I was very into athletics and sports and he really nourished that part of me. And also a lot of my friends were in my dad's neighborhood. So sometimes when we were at my mom's house, it was kind of a little more isolation. But my mom was really responsible for a lot of like academics and keeping up with a lot of our social lives. Again, even though it wasn't necessarily in her neighborhood. She kept up on like birthday parties and making sure we made those and planning play dates and all these things. I think she understood my social life better and knew a lot of my friends and my friend's parents as well. She was more on top of like meals every night, more on top of routine, I would say. I'm so glad you shared that, Sam, because, you know, I think that one would say a mom would abandon a child or move away or just disappear, that maybe they weren't being a mom before they left. But what you're describing is very mom stuff, routines and meals and setting up play dates and social life and homework. I mean, that's momming. And so, you know, you very much had that relationship with her, frankly, Sam, which magnifies the magnitude of the loss, because it wasn't like this was a checked out mom. What I'm hearing from you is that she actually, at least on these measures, was very present and was doing the things we would expect that a mother would do for both you and your brother. Yeah. And I would even say that I had the, not to like rate the relationships between my, my mom and my brothers, but I think I, I had the lowest like kind of attachment to her between my brothers. And so my brother Jared had an even stronger attachment. I think the way me and my dad kind of vibed in sports and whatnot, my brother Jared and my mom vibed a lot more with everything else. Like like he was much more of an academic and she mm -hmm. was very much into that. So, and it's not like I had a bad relationship with her. It's just more that I could see there was more of a closeness with them. And Reed, I know that she was your stepmother. How did that affect you? You were quite a bit older. How did it affect you when she left? She left right around a time when I was also like moving out and mm -hmm. I was actually living in Portland at the time. I thought it was just like the strangest thing and thought that she was just going to come mm -hmm. back like any day, you know, it's like seemed like the kind of thing where it's like, OK, something's happened and she's she's going to be back any day. And then time passes. I keep checking in with our dad and there's no news and it gets weirder and weirder as time goes on. So, Sam, can you share what it was like in those early days? Your mom's disappeared and it took a minute to figure out what had happened. What was that early period of time like for you? Not just when she had first left, but then when there was recognition that she was okay, but that she did not want to talk to you. How did all of that feel and play out for you? Initially, I think like one of the big memories that sticks out to me was continuing to go to my stepdad's house, even when my mom was very clearly gone and not, well, maybe we didn't know she was coming back yet, but there was like a good couple of months where we continued the routine of going over to my stepdad's house. And we would literally, Jerry and I would show up asking my stepdad, hey, is mom home? And then he would say no. And then he would ask a question back to us, have you heard from her? And it was a very bizarre exchange. And that's kind of what it's referencing with a little bit of the role reversal, where sometimes I felt like we also had to have some responsibility for where she was or having tabs on what's going on and when we had no idea. But that was kind of when 
I think it was starting to hit that it was like, this is not normal that we just keep going to this house, expecting her to be there, and she's not. And then when we found out that she wasn't coming back, we kind of heard about the investigator and that she wasn't going to be returning. That was hard, but I think that's when I made a pretty quick switch and I probably didn't emotionally process it very easily. I think I switched to like, oh, I'm independent. I'm a young man. I can do this. I've been able to do this and really just put off processing it altogether and didn't really think about it too much. So in a way, Sam, I'm hearing it's almost like you managed it a little bit like one might a death. Like she's gone. That's it. Keep going. Yeah, I'd say so. We'd get gifts sent to us for like Christmas and Mm -hmm. our birthdays. And she made sure that you couldn't track where they were coming from. And so (laughs) gift giving is kind of a triggering thing for me (laughs) sometimes. Uh, So mm -hmm. especially like packages. That was a thing that like, I don't know, held some sort of hope for me sometimes was like these these packages that would show up Mm -hmm. and almost like a replacement for her presence. But I, you know, I don't know, held on to it in some kind of way that was like, oh, she is coming back. And Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. yeah. Hope can be a miraculous thing and a treacherous thing. The gifts that would come from a person who disappeared, who is your mother and who didn't want to be found, but was still making her presence known, clearly brought up a mix of emotions. In an ambiguous situation like this, hope is really tricky. It begs the question of whether it would have been easier if she didn't send the gifts at all so Sam and his brothers could just move on. Hope can create connective tissue in a relationship, even when the person is physically gone. So it fostered a hope. And in a way, then that gift actually had quite a different impact and... I mean, at some level, one would say we would never know, we'll never know what her agenda was in sending those gifts because Mm -hmm. there was, you know, to send a gift from a mother that you'd have once had who has no intention of maintaining a relationship with you is an incredibly confusing experience. The question I have for you, Sam, it's interesting. You're going back to your stepfathers. Your mother's clearly not there. Your stepfather's asking you, have you heard from her I want to understand where the grownups were in all of this. Like, were your feelings being processed? Were there people so solicitous of you and holding you close and protecting you and soothing you? I'm confused as to why they'd send you there, like why they wouldn't just keep you in one place until that all got figured out. So can you break that down a little? Because I don't actually even fully understand that. Yeah, I would say that the Harkness family is very good at physically showing up and kind of like you mentioned that Mm -hmm. protective, they'll form that protective bubble around you and make sure your needs are met and be there. But the hard conversations aren't had and the asking for, you know, how I'm feeling or the emotional processing support isn't there really either. But, you know, my grandma was there so much for me um, Mm -hmm. just when my dad needed help with childcare. I think I was over at her house probably. And she lives two blocks away from my dad's Mm -hmm. house, which was really convenient. And she's kind of got this open door policy that, you know, me and my brother were probably there eating dinner five or six nights of the week. And again, she was there. She was great. But I don't remember anybody really coming to like ask us about what was happening. And for you, Reed, because obviously you were in the family system, though you were moving away. First of all, what was your relationship like with her? And then how did that, you know, how did you manage those early days of her being gone? And then when it got confirmed, she's not coming back. Before she left, I felt like our relationship had gotten kind of closer and closer, even though, you know, she's got this whole separate house that's a little bit more removed from the Harkness family. I would go over there. My stepbrother's close in age to me. So like we would do sleepovers over there, hang out with my brothers. And I felt like as I got older, I got closer with Joyce because we really shared this sort of like artistic drive. And she was really encouraging of like me taking Sam out and doing the filmmaking that Mm -hmm. we were doing. She was like, that's so great. You know, like she would just be so excited and she's like, I'd be like, okay, I'm here to pick up Sam. And she's like, great. Mm -hmm. You know, she's just, she was so encouraging. So I I think that my memory of her before leaving was that same kind of energy. And so I had a a kind of blind optimism when -hmm. it comes to this sort of road trip idea that it's like, if we can find her, 
Like she'll at least be able to connect with us in some way, you know? Mm -hmm. And I want to come into that road trip because this is the significant piece of the film. Before I get to that, for either of you, because I think a lot of viewers, myself included, when I saw the film, are going to wonder, did anyone, even the children in the family, see any red flags that would have led you not to say, well, of course she's going to leave because obviously you were all startled by it. But when you told the story backwards, you felt like, OK, I this doesn't this isn't completely in a vacuum or out of nowhere. Yeah, I think a couple months before she left, she was taking a few trips. I remember her going to Texas a couple times and maybe California once. And that was a little bit out of the ordinary for her. I don't remember her traveling much at all besides maybe to go visit her parents in Oregon. And we didn't go on trips very often either. When I traveled, it was usually with my dad. Yeah, not a lot with my mom. And her doing solo trips, that was like a little bit of like, oh, that's interesting that she's traveling by herself, not with my stepdad. But we were very well informed about it. We knew when she was leaving, when she was coming back and all that. So again, wasn't a red flag at the time. But now that I'm thinking about it, that was like, it's interesting to, to think about. Okay, so there was things that while they were happening, you never, nobody, Sam, would ever connect the dots of, she went to Texas and California, she's going to leave. I mean, that's not (laughs) how you connect that. But then you go backwards and you say there was that slight change in behavior. What about you, you, Reed? You were a little older. Was there anything you were observing that now in retrospect you thought, hmm? No, but Mm, when we started making a film about this, I did a really deep investigation where I was talking to all of our family members and all of her friends at the time, and stuff came out through that. So, like, I learned that she started kind of retreating from friendships, long-term friendships, and she was demoted at a job, and a few things were happening that kind of might have sent her to a place of feeling like she just... Her old life had kind of come to a place where she just wasn't happy anymore. Uh Mm -hmm. Okay, so again, things that could be told backwards, but in real time, A, you didn't know some of those things until afterwards, or B, when they were happening, it would have been a bit of a leap of conceptual leap to say, oh, she's gone to Texas, so she's going to leave. So I, I understand that. But what I want to do now is really get into this idea of the road trip, because this is why this is such a wonderful film, because not only is there this beautiful footage of a boy growing up, told through the lens of his brother, then all of a sudden it becomes a road trip film, which who doesn't love a road trip film? And a very, very unique road trip. It wasn't even until after I talked to Reed and Sam that it jumped out to me that healing is a road trip in its fashion, even if it's not literally in a car. Survivors of any kind of difficult, confusing relationship, especially if it is something as formative as a relationship with a parent, feel compelled to sort of go on a bit of a journey to figure it out. Reed and Sam got into a car to literally look for their mother and stepmother. Most survivors do this psychologically. They explore and ask questions and go backwards and forwards in their mind to figure it out. Where did this go? What just happened? So what I'd love to do is have you share with us what the goal of the road trip was going to be, what you hoped would happen from both of your perspectives. So here you are setting off on a road trip, honestly, like no other. What was the goal of this road trip? Sam was so gung-ho about this. He's like, this is happening during my mid-winter break. This is the only window I have. My schedule is really important, and this is the time frame that I have. So I was like... Okay, okay, I guess I guess we're I guess we're going then. And I was not prepared. First of all, I'm the only one that's got a driver's license. <laughs> and then and then like we're borrowing our dad's minivan and like we don't have any money. And so we're like borrowing money from family members. Our grandma sends us with like a batch of cookies. And you know, we didn't really have a solid lead, but We had one location, and we have this location in Long Beach, California. There's supposed to be like a a history professor that might have been in contact with her. So we're like, okay, we're going to just like go down there and meet this guy on his office hours, and that's going to be your best shot. So how did you come to the determination about the professor in Long Beach? Did you look at 
old correspondence? Was it a recollection you had? Yeah, so it came up through these interviews I was doing. This is like a research investigative process that I was doing. We're doing it through the film, and you can see how that comes about. Our stepbrother, Peter, through Joyce's first marriage, he's about my age. Um, we were having a conversation, and he mentioned mm. a name. And through research, we figured out that he was down at this university. And we thought that if we just cold called him, that he might just like hang up on us, you know, too easy for him to yeah. just like, you know, go cold. And so we thought our best shot was to like, you know, okay, here's the actual relative showing up at his office after driving a thousand miles. That's probably like, you know, he'd probably like, entertain us, you know? Okay. So you get in the minivan, you point it south, you drive the thousand miles, you show up at the university in Long Beach. And smartly so, you show up at office hours when all of us professors had to have our doors open. What happened when you got to Long Beach and showed up at the university? He wasn't there. As we often uh, are. As professors often miss their <laughs> office hours. So. We get there and not only is he like not there at the time, but we're told he's on semi-permanent leave of absence. He's out. So it was super discouraging. <laughs> Just a really upsetting thing for me who, you know, figured this was our one shot. It did feel like almost this just, you know, sign on the wall saying like, you failed, like you, this is it, that was it. <laughs> like you drove all this way and you, you failed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. It's kind of just like what if, like running into a wall immediately. Mm -hmm. So was the road trip a bust? No. Right after that, we went to the beach to throw a Frisbee and deliberate. And, you know, Sam is still maintaining his cool. He's like, yeah, well, we're at the beach. Let's throw a Frisbee. I was ready to break down. And I thought I was going to be the one that, like, you know, Sam might be crying on my shoulder. But at this point, I think, like, I'm ready to lose it. And Sam's being the sort of stable one. And... I realize in my notes that I have a few phone numbers, listings I had found for this professor. Mm. And so we decide on this beach to start making some phone calls. Well, I think we practice. Reed has me practice. Like if your mom picks up or if Professor Goslin picks up, what do you say? I was like, oh, yeah, well, I'll just say that I'm Sam. I'm her kid. Or, you know, if my mom picks up, I say, hi, mom. <laughs> I remember feeling excited because I had like some giddy energy. I think you can see it in the movie that, you know, I'm like kind of smiling through everything I'm saying. And I make the call and my mom picks up. I say like mom. And then I think she picks up that it's me pretty quickly, mm -hmm. too. I think I like talk for like five minutes straight, just updating her without her even like getting much of a word in. And mm. I'm just updating her on my life and Jared's life and what I'm doing. And I was like, I'm in California. I was looking for you as if that's a really normal thing to like, mm -hmm. in, like in an introduction, Hey, I was looking for you. And <laughs> hold on, let me tell you about like, I I've traveled to Europe. I've done all this stuff and I've been to Japan. Yeah. Uh, I got a girlfriend. I got a girlfriend. <laughs> Jared got Jared a girlfriend, got a girlfriend too. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Then it, it does end with an invite over to, to see her, to come see her. But also with a pretty like stern, don't tell anybody you found me or where I am or that you've spoken to me. And I think that was kind of understood from the beginning. Like, yeah, you've gone mm -hmm. through a lot of effort to not be found. I'm not going to mm. just tell everybody where you are. But it both ends with this welcoming, like, you and Reed, come, come see me, come in person. And also don't tell people about this. <laughs> I have to say that that moment of the film was incredibly, incredibly affecting for me when you are sitting on the beach, talking on the phone. And what was amazing to me, Sam, amazing, was you literally did just jump into a conversation, like just kind of giving her an update. So she was someone who had been on a business trip and you hadn't talked to her for a week or two, right? Mm -hmm. I have to say, Sam, the vast majority of people in your situation would have become rageful, angry, accusatory. 
How could you? There's something very special about you, I have to say. Your brother captured it initially saying you're very resilient. And it was there that I actually had to pause the film at that point. I was almost sort of crying and upset. Like, how is he able to do this? And he should be angry at her. Like, as though Sam was responsible for channeling my emotion in that scene, right? Anyone who watches this is an incredibly powerful scene. And so how did you just spring into just the update Instead of not only do you give her the update and not go to all the accusations, then she's asking you, hey, please do not, if you will, blow my cover. Do not share this. Like I said, the vast majority of people will say, to heck with you. Do you know how many people you affected? You affected Jared. And what it said, I am telling everyone where you are. You had no right to. No. You respected that boundary. You kind of were being sort of blue lantern-y there. That was sort of kind of epic because I think a lot of people would say, I'm not keeping your secret. I'm not doing this and would have likely reacted with a lot of negative emotion at the time of the call. So how did that play out for you? And what was happening inside of you that you were able to just make this about an update and you and Reed were able to show up and and not violate something she asked you to do? From the very beginning, as little foresight as I had back then in that trip, I think the one thing I knew I did want was to just pick up where he left off with my mom's relationship and not have to hold her accountable to anything. I don't think Mm. holding her accountable was ever a goal of mine. And in fact, was an area I wanted to steer clear of to not scare her away. I think I was worried about that as well. I even thought like sometimes when the camera was around, when we first get to see her when, when Reed and I got to see her like I, I had a little bit of anxiety about that and like maybe we should put the camera away Reed maybe we shouldn't film this as you know a major possibility of her being scared away and disappearing again and being even harder to find so <laughs> I hear and see people like kind of see that more like as resilience and bravery and I see a lot more as I'm willing to ignore Sam made such an important point here, and it was a revelation for me. I had to check myself because I got so caught up in the zeal of resilient Sam that I didn't step back and consider capitulating Sam, survival Sam, Sam who has mastered the ability to push emotions down to keep relationships going. This is so important because survivors are often congratulated. And right here, I am guilty as charged. I just did it with him right here. They're congratulated for not sharing their emotions, for not being angry. Maybe him holding back that anger wasn't necessarily a superpower, but simply a manifestation of how he was emotionally silenced by her loss. Yeah, to to kind of push feelings down Mm -hmm. for the sake of others there. Good for you for picking it up that way, because you're absolutely right. On a second watching of the film, I was like, wait a minute. You know, why does she still get to call the shots after her leaving and you were making accommodation for her, which my next thought was, this skill may not serve Sam well in the future. Yep. (laughs) And so I think that there is that moment of, wow, he's being so nice. Then it's, again, the next reaction was anger. Why does she still get to call the shots? She called the ultimate shots in many ways. It's Sam who should be accommodated to. And yet you were still doing the accommodating for a very clear reason, that you didn't want to scare her away. Reed, what was that day like for you that Sam got her on the phone and then the two of you rolled up to her house? Oh, what a mix of emotions. I mean, definitely one of the most like profound moments, day moments, you know, so much is happening there. And it's reduced to just me and Sam, you know, like we're the only ones experiencing this and we're not allowed to talk about it with anyone. So it's like, there's this strange electricity, like, what does this mean? Mm -hmm. What's going to happen? What's she going to be like when we see her? See, I was just like, it'll be cool. Everything's going to be fine. (laughs) We don't need to really even talk about it. I'm just excited to see her. And for me, it's just more questions are coming up. I just, I'm just like, well, why, if she is so cool with us coming, like, why did she have to be hidden for so long? Like, why couldn't she have just reached out? It's so, it was so strange. And then when we get there, she's uh, all smiles and hugs and welcoming and even has like, 
like sushi and like the very same soda that she used to have in the fridge at their old house. She was keyed in to bits of this old life and she was able to step back into that performance of who she was as a mother instantly. Mm. But like right away, there's no like, I'm sorry. Or like, gosh, oh my gosh, you guys have been through so much. I can't believe it. You know, it was just like, here I am. And then we go and we like have this like sit down thing at a coffee shop. And she basically gives this this passionate spiel about why she left, which is another scene in the movie that is just very intense. So you went from the house to the coffee shop, and that's where she starts talking about her why. That's right. Sam, to start with you, what did it feel like to hear her why, her reason for leaving? And how did that affect your process of sort of figuring all of this out? I remember not holding a ton of value in it. It's not going to be that valuable to me to know why. And I think also... Like, knowing my mom, she can be somewhat manipulative in a very, like, charismatic way. And I kind of know sometimes when I'm stepping into that. And Mm -hmm. that felt like one of those times. So it just didn't feel like a full, like, honest answer and reasoning. And, yeah, it felt more like I have to defend myself first before I actually give you any kind of, like, substantial reasoning behind what I did. Okay, so you got her defense. Mm -hmm. When the substantial reasoning came, did it ring true? Or like you said, you you were able to see it with a grain of salt, knowing that it may potentially be sort of a distortion or a manipulation? Well, the the thing is, I don't know if I've ever actually heard or discussed with her a full reasoning why. Mm -hmm. And so I don't think I've gotten that deep with her yet before. Wow. So you still, after all these years, you haven't gotten that deep. With her, this is. I'm going to ask you a strange question, which you may not be able to answer. Do you think she knows? <laughs> That's a. That is a great question. I'm not sure. I don't. I don't mm-hmm. know. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. I want to say she. She has been putting in some work more recently mm-hmm. on. Good. Just a lot of what's going on, but I don't know. I don't know for sure. And Reed, you were at that same coffee shop meeting, so you heard sort of the defense followed by sounds like a not very convincing sort of why, as it were. How did that encounter leave you feeling? That coffee shop explanation was so intense. I mean, she says things like, I had to leave to get out of the control of everybody and then like rebuild her life. So basically she's saying she had to leave and she had to start a new life. And I couldn't make sense of that. I mean, even to this day, I play back that tape or I watch that scene and There's a lot of things in there that I'm still trying to, like, really understand. I think it's possible that, you know, she was going into a place where she was she was really losing her mind and would have been an unpleasant person to be around. But I still can't get over the simplicity of just like, okay, well, once you're able to send a gift or once you're able to, like, just send a letter, you know, like, just let these guys know, because the more time that goes on, I could see that it was like, it was getting worse. I just felt like I had so many more questions at that point. Mm -hmm, And so mm -hmm. I kept going back and interviewing her and talking to her and trying to like crack this open because I wanted to understand and I wanted to know, was there things that were happening? Was like, there like any like abuse or anything that like would have really made a person need to go on like a witness protection plan level escape. And it doesn't seem like that's what you found out. No, I didn't find anything like that out. But we did learn a lot about Joyce's upbringing. And I think that that's really the thing is that You know, Sam brought up like attachment with his dad and his mom and I felt a little more attached to his dad. I mean, in Sam's case, he had attachment to two parents. I think that in Joyce's case, she didn't have any parental attachments. Like the way she describes it and the way that we see her adoptive family on camera, there wasn't a secure mm-hmm. attachment potentially. Mm-hmm. And I and I don't know, you can tell me as a psychologist if this is where this kind of behavior begins. You know, as you're you're asking, Reed, is you weren't learning about some sort of very clear reason 
why she left, but what you did unearth was more information about her family of origin, which wasn't a safe place. It wasn't characterized by attachment. We come to find out that Joyce was adopted, and there's a complicated series of issues related to that. Absolutely, those things can matter. Attachment is so important to how we go through the world as adults that it can shape things. So in essence, a seed may have been planted decades before in the sense that when people have disruptions in early attachment, it could be the loss of a caregiver. It could be chaos in the early family system. It could be neglect, coldness. It could be abandonment at a very young age. And attachment is laid down when we're young. Most of this happens before the ages of three and four, as the child is looking to a safe, consistent place to come to, where they feel that their vocalizations will be recognized and responded to by a caregiver. And there were disruptions and all of that is, you know, what you had heard from Joyce. And that absolutely can result in this. People who don't have secure attachments will often have anxious or avoidant or disorganized attachments in adult life, which means intimacy becomes difficult. Empathy becomes difficult. The capacity for staying in uncomfortable circumstances because because of that lack of intimacy and depth, some people just want to do a cut and run because it just doesn't feel safe. And so all of those early attachment experiences, this is why This is why supporting new parents and creating safety for children, it's not just putting time into an infant. It is a payout that can last 70, 80, 90 years because it will affect how that person goes through life in perpetuity. The attachment wounds that Joyce experienced absolutely could be a major explanatory factor into how she was able to leave a custodial role being the mother to three sons because she also had... Peter, yeah? Mm -hmm. So she's the mother to three sons, a stepmother to a son. That's a lot to leave. And so it often isn't a simple explanation. And once we open the lid on attachment, we recognize that these are wounds that far predated the birth of any of you. And that you ended up kind of getting, and this is why we talk about intergenerational trauma and intergenerational cycles. The tracks for this were planted long before the next generation even exists. And that becomes important as a way of lifting a sense of responsibility for the survivors who had absolutely nothing to do with this. They came long after those initial traumas were set. And these can sometimes be cycles handed down two, three, four, even more generations. So it's quite profound. Do you have any thoughts about that? I mean, that's super enlightening for me. I find like, you know, this this story to, you know, be a really complex narrative in that like we're looking at all these different members of family. We're looking at different generations. And, you know, we're starting to see all of these clues. You start to see kind of a map. Mm-hmm. And I think it is the kind of movie that you can watch multiple times mm-hmm. in order to get more out of it. Yeah. But, you know... You know, me starting with a simple question of like, why is Sam resilient? These things start to get answered through looking at this sort of like generational mapping. And Mm -hmm. it's also strange, but I, it all begins to make sense at the same time. Like, yes, that makes sense if, you know, at 18 months, Joyce was in a Japanese orphanage at the end of World War II and the circumstances were really crazy and a military family adopted her and brought her back probably under some pressure from the military that, you know, there's just too many orphaned babies now, mixed race orphan babies in, in Japan. She comes to Oregon and, and finds that she doesn't feel like she fits in or is accepted or she, there's not a good connection. And that persists, you know, all the way through her teens, it seems. We don't have enough information to like really right. understand right. what goes on mm-hmm. there. But uh, from her story, it was not a healthy experience, not a positive experience. Sam, what was it like for you as more and more light got shed on your mother's origin story of being adopted from a Japanese orphanage at a time when the mixed race orphans were really, really viewed through the most dehumanizing of lenses, coming to the States, not having healthy, secure attachments with the adoptive family. As that picture filled out for you, how did it impact your process of growth, healing, moving beyond this sort of experience that happened when you're 12 or 13 years old. Yeah, I think it, there's there's multiple points of like, I, I can kind of remember when more light was being shed on everything and mm-hmm. my kind of perception of it all was growing. But I do remember having a very little understanding when I was younger. I remember once having, 
a conversation with my mom, maybe when I was like younger than 10, I didn't really understand adoption very well. And I had asked her, <laughs> sounds really weird, but <laughs> why doesn't she just look for her biological mom or like mm. something like that? And she snapped at me. I remember in a way that was just kind of like, we don't like, I'm not going to talk about this with you anymore. And I remember like, so an early messaging of, yeah, it's not something we talk about. And then there were other clues later on just about kind of like, I think the mistreatment she kind of had from her adoptive family. And I would hear little stories about how she was kind of just like a second class family member to everybody and the punishments she would go through, like time out standing in corners. And I think they had like a pet monkey at one point that oh. she she would always talk about how the monkey was a higher up family member than her. Yeah. So I was getting all these clues that like this adoptive life was not good for her mm-hmm. and that she won't talk about the biological life. And so I think later on when I started to learn more and more after we had found my mom again and she talked about it a little bit more, I think I started to understand a little bit more of, of the like the trauma that was involved. And, you know, now it kind of feels like she's experienced two different abandonments through her life, one from her biological family and then one, you know, although I think she also distanced herself, but like you see in the movie, her mom, teen, her adopted mom, teen, like says that there is no Joyce to her anymore. So that's like a second basically abandonment happening there as well. So I think I started to understand and empathize a lot more that like she Mm -hmm. had gone through a lot. Yeah, I think just Mm -hmm. just that understanding was really helpful Mm -hmm. for me. It's it's good to know. It's very interesting you say that, you know, her own adoptive mother saying there is no more Joyce to me, but actually the person who endured sort of the worst of the abandonment was you and you did hold space for her, which really is a, it's an interesting juxtaposition that in this case, it was the child who was behaving most compassionately. And this is something we'll circle back to in a little bit, but what gets so challenging is to hear a story like Joyce's, which you receive with compassion, of course. This is a this is a very complicated early life to be a child, to have been brought to another country, to be treated like a second-class citizen, and what that would do to someone. And yet, Sam, Reed, you endured something very real. And it's the balancing of those two truths, the truth of Joyce's early difficult life and the truth of the losses that you endured, Jared, Peter, all of you endured. And those two things can coexist, but it creates something very uncomfortable where you ping pong between going back and forth between, I feel bad for her, I I don't feel good. I feel bad for her, I don't feel good. And the hard work is being able to hold those two things simultaneously in your mind to hold compassion for her, but also hold grace for yourself. Self and giving yourself permission to be angry and not saying, well, she went through that, so I have no right to be angry. You have a right to feel any way you want. It's the only way for these emotions to be processed. It's one of the things that was stunning about the film was that we as the viewer had to sit with the discomfort of the story. And when you created that discomfort in us, we were able to have tremendous empathy with the discomfort that all of you had to endure at a relatively young age. So I really, I appreciate that about your storytelling. So after Long Beach, after the coffee shop meeting, after all of that, what happens? All road trips come to an end. Did you just turn the minivan around and drive back to Portland? What happened after that? A lot of things happen. In the movie, you can see there's like a point where I like stand up and address the family over what's gone on. But I think we should just fast forward to Sam is still just like wanting to protect Joyce in this scenario. Feels like, you know, like, hey, everything's fine and she's back in my life. We're good. Everything's good now. And I, one of the last things I say is like, well, don't you want to know why she left? She's like, no, I'm good. Like, everything's good now. So fast forward to years later, Sam's point of view changes pretty dramatically. Can you talk about that, Sam? And then many years later, you go from, I don't need to know why, I'm going to, you know, in essence, protect her. What shifted for you? And why did that happen? Yeah, sabotage my own relationships with behaviors I was like recognizing as some of like my mom's behaviors too, which I could pick up on being annoying and I could recognize like, this is like not how I want to behave. But I didn't quite pick up on like, oh, that's stuff my mom would do. Not until I went to therapy afterwards. Mm. And I kind of had a three-year relationship that went really poorly and it was totally my fault and felt a lot of shame and guilt around it. And that was kind of the catalyst for me going to therapy. And that's when I started to work a lot more on like 
you know, this is kind of the impact I think a lot of this, a lot of the abandonment had on me. And not even just the abandonment, but like some of the more toxic behaviors I'd seen in my mom throughout my life too. It's interesting what you're describing, Sam, because we see this in many people who go through what you went through. They go through it in childhood. They go through it. They don't think about it. Don't even have languaging for it. And then come into adulthood and then notice that there are things in their life that are not going well, particularly intimate relationships, and then sort of begin to connect those dots. Joyce's behavior, you were hurt by it. You know, there's no way you could soften that, that this did directly affect you. It wasn't that Joyce did something and I can find a way to think differently about it. Oh, we don't have to take it on. We don't need to talk about why she did it. This is when people say, just think differently. I'm like, yeah, no, it doesn't work that way. You yeah. know, that the, the poison comes up through the, the groundwater, as it were, like the, this stuff, if it's not processed, it doesn't mean we're doomed. It means it needs to be processed. Mm-hmm. And so and that's the piece is that and you did go to therapy. And, and this is what therapists do. We're just really good at connect the dots because it's not our story. It's not our life. So we're able to get a little bit of a, a zoomed out view to help a person connect those dots and start seeing that. I want to go back a little bit ahead of that because Long Beach, you go back, mom drops you off, and there's still, though, that disconnect for Joyce. She did not feel the need to see Jared. That also is very affecting, that why wouldn't you, you've seen your one son, why wouldn't you want to see your other? So she remains still very, very detached. And then she turns around, she goes home. It, but it wasn't like it was over there. Your mom, Joy, started coming back into your life. There was now going to be more contact. How did that play out? I know Reed, you know, talked to the family, said what was going on, but it's not like then she went to Long Beach and disappeared. She actually became a little bit more of a presence in your life again. What did that feel like? It definitely felt like this very tightrope walk of a of a balance of We have a small relationship and we see each other once a year, maybe, and very much on her terms. Like, you know, she she didn't really come to Seattle. Maybe she came once every three years or so. And it was us having to visit her, which I always thought was difficult because three of her sons were in Seattle and, you know, Mm -hmm. what parent wouldn't love to have all of their adult kids in the same city to like visit at the same time. That was kind of like me starting to realize that like, you know, she's not going to leave her comfort zone. She's going to keep everything on her terms. And as flexible as she makes herself seem with like, yeah, I'll like buy a train ticket for you to come out or do whatever. But it's like very much we have to go out to you. Yeah. And yeah, you're not going to come to us. So that was like kind of that middle part of the relationship was a lot of space still, so much space. And yeah, it wasn't exactly what I'd hoped for. A piece of their story that is actually very telling and may not be completely clear is that Joyce did end up moving away from Long Beach to Southern Oregon. As Sam points out, her children are all in Seattle. So she is closer, but still far enough that seeing each other would be logistically challenging. This feels almost metaphorical that in these kinds of challenging relationships, There may be some shift, but that that larger goal of connection and closeness feels elusive. Reed, were you part of this whole journey of like Joyce coming back into everyone's life or was this much more something that was for Sam and his brother? It was mostly for Sam and Jared, Mm -hmm. Jared especially. So Jared was invited to come live with her. You might have been invited too, Sam, I don't remember, but Jared was invited. He goes and he lives with her down in Southern Oregon. And she really is involved with like getting him back on track. It's like, they're just like, okay, let's deal with uh, school. Let's get you, you know, enrolled in a university. Let's get you a job, Let, you know, all of the driver's license, like all of these things she was so good at with Jared. And it, Jared is just like, just springs back to life mm. from somebody who's so depressed and doesn't want to do a thing to, you know, really right away after we found her, he bounces back in school. He bounces back his energy. He's like, there's like a shot in the movie where he's throwing a Frisbee with us. And I don't think he had like done anything like that in the last few years. Like he just was just (laughs) like a a lump on the couch. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really sad to think about now, but the Jared that we know now is like, is not that way. He actually like works with those kind of kids at the same school where we see him in the movie. 
and like helps them with like confidence and turning in their assignments and yeah. all these things, which is pretty special. So Joyce played an active mother role for Jared and helped him kind of bounce back. But with Sam, she wasn't really, it was all still very compartmentalized and like she wouldn't just come up and visit us all together. That wasn't a thing. Sam and Jared were invited to go down there or Sam and Jared and Peter might have been invited to go down there on like these very special invitations. And then I was still doing my thing, which is like, I started a project, I started a film about this. And so I would go and I would visit with her and film as like, you know, she's doing stuff with Jared or interview Joyce to just kind of learn more about the story and her upbringing, that kind of thing. And so our relationship became very tied to the movie. Mm, okay. And it's interesting, Reed, if we go all the way back, one of the things that facilitated your early relationship with Joyce was how enthusiastic she was about your creative pursuits. So, I mean, the very thing she brought, she brought again. And so there was a consistency to that. And, and to then witness Jared sort of coming back to life, it speaks to how muddy the water of these complicated relationships is. The easy thing to do, if somebody gave you the elevator pitch of this film, coming of life film, mother abandoned son, sons go on road trip and find her, people would immediately paint Joyce to be the two-dimensional villain. What kind of woman leaves her children? But what happens is, is you punch the story out, as we have to do in all of these stories. What happens for the people in your role, Sam, Jared, Reed, it's so complicated because something terrible did happen. And she was a attentive mother at one point. And Jared did pop back to life when she came back. And she was still very cagey. And she still did want things on her terms. This kind of ebb and flow, roller coaster, good things, bad things, is the characteristic of these sorts of complex and at times antagonistic relationships. The film brings that to light. But here we think of the most, this idea of a mother abandoning a child is really sort of like a top shelf of like things you never do. And it happened and it's still not that simple. Yeah. I, I just want to speak to, uh, Reed was going over some of the poster ideas with me. And there was one where he was talking about, there's like a silhouette of my young, my young face and, and then they wanted to have a, my mom's silhouette, like back to back in this like kind of sunset looking poster. And I was like, absolutely not. Like, this is not like a protagonist antagonist. Like, I think I was in a lighter light and, and hers was a darker light. And that's just too easy. That's <laughs> like, that's way too simplified yes. of a story. Um, it really reminded me of this like Anakin Skywalker <laughs> or like Darth, Darth Vader type. It's like, this is not like, hero villain we got to be more complex than that and like mm -hmm. yeah mm -hmm. and, and i think that that's where this film is so powerful is that what every survivor says is that i've gone through something terrible this relationship whatever form it takes has hurt me and everyone's like oh they're terrible they're terrible and the person experiencing the relationship says it's not that simple because if it was i would have just walked away and cut this person out and this is the core of what we struggle with in every story we tell and it's really magnified in your story so what's happening though in the background because now joyce has moved just so listeners are more clear joyce is no longer in california she's moved closer she's only about five hours away so she is a lot closer to everyone, though not that close. Five-hour drive is still a, quite a distance. But in the midst of all this, you still have your your father's family. How are they supporting you through this part of it? Because I have to say, as complicated as it was to deal with the initial abandonment and finding her, what's even more complicated is this very delicate dance of bringing her back into your life. And initially, you were really, really, really careful, Sam, because you were trying to, in essence stave off another abandonment, but you're still very embedded in your father's life and your extended family. How were they helping you through this process? Yeah, um, I think that my dad was very supportive and appreciated, I think, the relationship, like rebuilding the relationship with our mom. And again, kind of like very results oriented wise, he was very happy with how Jared was doing. You know, Jared coming back and like graduating and just having a job, having a car, having all this success. And I do want to mention that when my mom came up to Seattle and visits my dad's house and my grandma's house. 
you know, those were two things that I had kind of in my mind eliminated as never ever happening again. You like kind of just categorize it as like, this person will never be in this space again. And I understand that. And when it happened, it was very like blew kind of my mind and almost shut off a lot of the processing of what was going on because environmentally I was not prepared for it. The people who were talking to each other, my dad, and my mom talking to each other, wasn't prepared for that either. It just kind mm. of almost triggered a fight, flight or freeze for me. And I was very frozen, very much couldn't understand. To me, that time period, that like day is a snow globe captured piece that, you know, it's just completely outside of the ordinary, completely outside of the relationship I have my mom. Mm. Like, I can't fit it anywhere in the entirety of this story at all. Like, it, <laughs> I don't understand it still to this day. <laughs> Reed, do you have any insights on that day? Because it was actually quite, it was, it was a very interesting moment. Yeah. This is coming after Sam's confronted Joyce through letters about her leaving him and the effect it's had on him. And his he's actually angry as a grown adult. And he's said some pretty interesting things. But he's requested also that Joyce makes more of an effort to come and like, be a part of our lives in Seattle, especially like come see Sam and Jared, come try to be a little more normal about the relationship and what is normal, who knows, but, Hmm. but he, he's like made this request. He really wants Joyce to like be a little more active and proactive. And so this, on this Halloween day in 2015, she comes up and just applies all of this energy to reinserting herself back into the whole Harkness family. She's like, let's go surprise Randy and then let's go see grandma and, you know, on a total whim. And so she's like kind of getting a kick out of the uh, the surprise factor. And wouldn't it be funny if this happened and, you know, and w- what's going to happen? What's going to happen next? And in my mind, I think that she was charged by Sam's request. And I wonder if, she was intentionally self-sabotaging it at the same time. It is interesting because one of the things that jumps out at me at this is there is a certain, it's a little bit of a lack of empathy of what would it be like if I showed up? What is it like if I show up at all these people's houses? What, what I'm saying is that empathy is not just understanding the feelings of others, but understanding our impact on other people and catching ourselves before we do something that may not I don't know, feel good for the other person, right? And so there was a little bit of an empathic fail there in the sense of, I'm going to come in. And like you said, Reed, was this shock value? Was this lack of awareness? Was this, this is what I feel like doing, so I'm just going to do it? That, obviously, we don't know. But it definitely seemed a bit tone deaf at best. Yeah. And I mean, I will say also that, like, the family is used to drop-ins on each other. Like, we're all, like, kind of loose in this way. It's like, we were free-range kids. But, you know, this is something really different that's happening. We're, like, you know, people that hadn't seen her in, like, 15 years. And, uh, you know, she comes to the door and my dad doesn't even recognize her. Like, invites her in, thinks she's just, like, some friend of ours. And then (laughs) she comes in and it takes him, like, you know, a couple minutes before he's, like, oh, my gosh, it's Joyce. And then things, like, are, like, oh, okay. And now he's, like... Now he's going into this place where he's like, what do I do about this situation? And, you know, he's such a sweet guy. And he really, Mm -hmm. you can see in the scene, he's like, okay, well, like, let's kind of roll with this and see how it plays out. You know, and he's just, he's a first grade teacher for like 30 years. Mm -hmm. So he's like been through all kinds of experiences with with kids and has this temperament that's just like kind of just like, okay, we'll just kind of go with things here and... (laughs) And then we all go over to our grandma's house and the party kind of grows. But it's at grandma's house where we really, where Joyce reaches a point where she really starts to like let us in a little bit more to what's going on with her. And our grandma, who's a very wise lady um, and has done lots of work with early child development and attachment and all these things that like actually happens to approach Joyce about narcissism and offers her a book on narcissism. And Joyce says, that's me. Hmm. Um, And then she goes on to sort of describe her coping mechanism a little more clearly for the first time. And 
it's pretty enlightening, even after we've gone through this roller coaster of a day of like, you know, we're surprising our dad, and then, and this is uncomfortable, and then mm -hmm. like grandma just like embraces her and puts on tea and and like let's talk, like you know, just just like old times. And her experience of that day was that like how nice it was that you know Joyce came back into the fold and. I think my dad's experience was just like what a unnerving what a mm. he says the word it was it was freaky it was freakish to me mm. Mm. <laughs> so it was a mix of many things and I think it was you know it wasn't what Sam had wanted I think he had mm -hmm. wanted something mm -hmm. different do what did you want Sam what did you want to have happen mm -hmm. yeah maybe just like a dinner with me Jared and Peter would have been that would have ah. been a good start. <laughs> yeah. You know, I don't need her to keep herself secret from everybody, but yeah, I think letting more people in on what like could mm. be happening instead of having having the jump on them a little bit would, would have been better. Like I would have loved for my grandma and my, my mom to like meet and see each other. And I know actually that relationship's going still very well for them, but I just, yeah, I think it was not approached very well. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, I love that moment when your grandmother's like, okay, well, this is what I think you are. And it actually puts a finer point on that one thing we know is many people with any kind of narcissistic presentation do have some sort of traumatic origin. The entire narcissistic presentation then is sort of a defense against that kind of existential hole that the attachment disruptions can sometimes cause. And so everything's a defensive maneuver with little regard for the other people. So your grandmother was spot on. What was really compelling to me was how Joyce was actually able to receive it and says, yes, that's me, which actually isn't the normative reaction. Most people who've handed a book about narcissism would either throw it against the wall, start to rage, how dare you? What was fascinating to me was Joyce's willingness to be in that moment with it. Again, not unusual with people who have had more of that traumatic origin. So narcissism is also not a singular picture because the origins of it can come down so many different pathways. In some ways, that can also affect the presentation. You know, there's a point that came up in the film. I'm going to be selfish here because I found it very affecting. And I've told you that I found this really affecting, which was when... Your mom, who's left your life, comes back in your life, lives five hours away, expects you to come see her, that there was a one year, one year at Christmas, Sam, when you had a lot of stuff going on in your life. And it was like, I, you just didn't reach out. You didn't feel that you something you had to do. She became very angry. As the viewer, I mean, you did something almost Hitchcockian here that you you left so many things towards the end, and yet we felt like we were seeing them all along. It was genius filmmaking. And so I remember I was there with Joyce. I really was. I was there with her. I was there with all of you. Then she pulled what I call the Christmas maneuver, and that was the moment Joyce lost me. I remember literally talking to the screen and saying, how dare you? Sam owes you nothing. He does not owe you a Merry Christmas. Don't ever watch a movie with me, by the way, because it's a whole conversation thing. But I was like, how could you do this to Sam? So, Sam, now I get the privilege of hearing from you. What was happening for you? You said, yeah, I can't be bothered this Christmas. And then you had to withstand some of her anger. What was that moment like for you? You know, at, at that point too, I'd, I'd been pretty far along in my in my like social work career. And so mm. some of the professional skills I had been developing and, and working on, but I think which also just kind of fit my own like, you know, personality and, and the soft skills I already had growing up. I definitely had a, had an immediate response of like the kind of, you know, she had this how, how dare you tone and the immediate thought was also like, how dare you? Like, where, where do you think I get it from? But um, so I, I, I really tried to absorb it in this way that was like, wow, I'm really sorry. I hurt you. I am a little bit overwhelmed. And I was going on this like kind of like getaway with my girlfriend to like a little staycation. It's going to be a weekend long. And I was like, can I really get back to you after this, like after the staycation? I've been like working super hard. And I think I actually worked every holiday too. I was, I was working in homelessness youth services and I was working in the shelter at the time. And yeah, I kind of just like was trying to be accountable to it. And probably a little bit of me was social working here a little bit. Like I was like, I'm really sorry. It's my mistake. I did this and I, want, and I hurt you. Let me like get back to you on this when I get back and and that only enraged her further and she sent like a couple more emails like right back and this is I'm on the I'm on like the ferry 
to this like one hour away destination where we have this Airbnb set up and everything. And yeah, within that time, she sends like two more pretty scathing emails where she's kind of yelling at me for like being ungrateful and that I, I was always mad at her, never let it go that she had left or <laughs> never forgave her. And a lot of things that were just like pretty hurtful. After like a couple responses, I was like pretty hurt and I didn't have it left into me for like to hold together relationships. I was kind of ignoring it again. And then she again sent a couple more emails. So it, she got caught up in this big whirlwind of like she needs to be like getting all this out at me. But eventually there was like a very much apologetic email where she mentions also that, you know, there's there's a lot of harm that happened to me when I was younger. And also there's, I was in therapy for a long time and all this stuff. And, you know, I'm unhinged to like, basically she's like admitting to being like, to, to having these mental health issues. Mm-hmm, um, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And it was bizarre. It was weird. It was isolating for me. I don't think any of my other brothers got that side of her ever. And I started to feel this like, I'm the scapegoat of my brothers. I'm the one she can like do this to and know it's going to be okay. And Mm -hmm. that I, and especially now in my line of work where like I, you know, you can say those things to me and it's Mm -hmm. okay. So I have to like put up more boundaries now with her in that aspect of like, Mm -hmm. I I can't, I'm not going to let you isolate me. I'm not going to let you like do these things where you like, if if this is going to happen, you have to do it to all my brothers, (laughs) not just me. But yeah, Mm -hmm. so that, that was pretty hard. And, and really difficult when I confronted my brothers about it and, and showed them the emails, like, has this ever happened to you? And they're like, no. It is not unusual in a family system where the person who may have some narcissistic-ish patterns will focus on one person in the family system that they are more dysregulated with or demanding of and take out more of their rage with and might typically be seen, just as in this case with siblings, with one sibling being a bit more of a scapegoat and getting the worst of it, and the others getting little or none of it at all. And not only doesn't feel good, it can feel worse when the people it's not happening to may minimize it or play it down, which can sort of feel gaslighty. This triangulated dynamic, which appears at various times in this story, is a signature element of family systems impacted by these personality styles. Not even just no, but excused her a little bit too. Like, Mm. I don't think this is going to be a thing. I don't think you have to worry about it. And I was like, I don't know. I'm like worried about it being more of a pattern. And yeah, it was kind of ignored and not dealt with. Yeah. That doesn't feel good. I mean, that that doesn't feel good. Read as one of, I mean, again, this is a unique opportunity. Here you are. You were part of this conversation. Did you really believe you just thought this wasn't going to happen anymore? I will say, Kavi, <laughs> that Reed actually, I think, was hearing me more. Okay. It was more, it was Jared and Peter who. Oh, they, okay. Okay. Sorry. They have more of a relationship on the line. Yeah. I think. Okay. Uh, okay. Yeah. You know, again, you, you a lot of what you were having to bear under Sam was sort of the projected shame of Joyce, right? That's the nature of these relationships is that the shame builds up to such an intolerable level in her. She doesn't have healthy tools for coping with it. And in these relationships, people with these personality styles, they project that shame on the person they believe evoked that shame. You evoked that shame without having the Christmas greeting. You were going to get the worst of it. In many ways, it's quite likely that Jared and Peter weren't so much in that shame evoking role. And the shame evoking role is often the person who puts up with them a little bit more and then sometimes sets a boundary. And so the, that person, and you did, you set a boundary. I need to, I'm going to go and do what I need to do this weekend, spend time with my partner. So when we understand it that way, it doesn't mean it's any less hurtful. Listen, someone, someone does anything, someone pushes and shoves you, that's going to hurt. Even if you understand what's behind the shove, there's still a moment of hurt and pain. So I, I really appreciate you sharing that. And now may I ask this, what is your relationship with your mother like now? Right before this movie released, it was pretty good in a sense that like we were checking in almost every month to every other month. And mm-hmm. I think we do sometimes have to like, you know, there was a, a Thanksgiving where it felt like, you know, I there's a certain amount of time we can be around each other before I start to have anxiety about her or she maybe feels, yeah, that like I'm invoking some sort of shame out of her. So, you know, it's, it's, I think we're starting to understand how much we can actually like interact with each other. And I want more for sure. I always want more out of it, but I'm being as realistic as possible Mm -hmm, as, mm -hmm. as I'm moving forward. I think every kind of 
minute this film is out, I have a worry that she'll see it and that she's going to have some response of, you know, on a spectrum from disappearing again to like maybe Mm -hmm. someone more in the middle of just yelling at me and Reed or, or silence or I don't, I'm not entirely sure, but Mm -hmm. yeah. Or seeing it and then holding it in and never, never speaking to anybody about it, how she feels about it. And that would also be terrible. Yeah. So there's, there's a lot of anxiety right now with the film being out that like something could change and I really should immediately. Mm -hmm. And as far as we know, she hasn't seen it, but yeah, I don't know. But there's a precariousness and a fragility that the relationship has with always that this is now something that's hanging out there as a possibility. Mm -hmm. So before we end, we'd like to play this clip. So when we set out to find your mom, what were you hoping to accomplish? I I think I had kind of a fantasy in mind of what was going to happen. I don't think I actually cared that much for a relationship with my mom. At that point, I was like fairly uh, independent and I didn't really think it through, to be honest, like emotionally, how I'd feel about it or what it would do to me. Did you get what you wanted? If you were to ask me like right after the trip, did I get what I wanted? I would have said yes. But now asking myself in like my late twenties, no. Even finding her, like the connection is still a little severed. Later on in my adult life, I kind of found out that I was both concerned with myself being capable of abandoning somebody and also concerned about being abandoned by more people. And then realizing that I had that like, capability, I was like, oh no, like I can't just like shut somebody out. So do you agree with that? I think that's like a really eloquent kind of laying out of what has happened. Do you still, given that was part of the film and now some time has passed, how do you feel about that? I would say some of those fears are still very valid in my life. Mm-hmm. And and sort of a kind of I'd mentioned before, I don't think I've ever really gotten a full understanding or explanation from my mom about why she left. But sometimes when I'm acting out the same behaviors she has had that were like kind of negative behaviors of uh, sabotage, abandoning others, distancing myself you know, emotionally and physically, that's the closest I get to understanding what she did and why she did it is is whenever I'm playing that through or like also playing out that same cycle. But I, I definitely have recognized it more. And so I can step out of it easier. I can remove myself. I can more prevention of it as well. I would say then when, the, when that video was being taped, I was kind of like in the middle of it and having a hard time with it and barely getting out of it. And now I'm in a much better spot mm-hmm. of... I can see it coming. Yeah, and like replacing a lot of those maladaptive coping mechanisms with better ones that serve me a lot better. And I think that's great to hear, Sam, because it's a real reminder that people do, we do get out of these acute states of distress and we do find our footing. And I mean, I'll I'll be frank with you, Sam, very rarely in this kind of a relationship does anyone get that question of why ever answered. And it's learning how to move forward. It's its own form of ambiguous grief. Right, learning to move forward without ever knowing the why. If someone in front of us we love dies from a disease, we're sad, especially if they died prematurely, but we understand that they got a disease. There's a why that we can get our head around. This why is, again, is so many whys in these relationships never get answered. We have to struggle to make our meaning of it, but then we also have to learn to move forward not only without that why, but also never blaming ourselves, because that's the tendency many, many survivors have. And then finding that balancing act of how to have a relationship with her where the fear of her abandoning you again holds you back from making decisions in the relationship that are healthy for you. Do you have any further thoughts, either of you, Sam, Reed? I do have something I want to say, which is Joyce is somebody who, like, she's done some things within these stories that are hurtful, right? And we've pointed out these sort of specific things where, you know, this is the, this is a hurtful thing that has happened, you know? Leaving your kids is a really big one. And then certainly these sort of, these later things where Sam feels targeted. But even still, you know, she's still an active family member mm-hmm. for all of us here. And none of us are trying to push her away. Even in making the movie, 
it's not about bringing shame to Joyce. It's about understanding her and trying to understand her and all the characters and what has happened and really look at sort of like the fact is some of these things are like outside of uh, any of our control. These are things that might have happened at 18 months old. This sort of patterning and Sam, you know, works in this professionally. He coaches in mm -hmm. breaking out of patterns. But like, I think that we'll have to realize that it's like not really about us. It's like mm -hmm. these are things that like they exist in a lot of families. And, you know, when we do feel isolated, alone, the answer to that is to share. And I know that Joyce put a great distance between herself and her kids and the Harkness family. You know, partially that's like her her thing. She can do that. You can do that in your life if you want. But it did create some reactions, right? It created some things. And I just hope that people, you know, society, our families can start to evolve a little bit more to a place of like, how do we understand this a little bit better? How can we get to a place where we like really can like embrace these qualities and that like this is a condition this is something that is is real in our family and a lot of other families <laughs> and how can we move forward as a family without severing without like alienating without like pushing somebody out i think i think it's really hard and we might not ever get to that place but i feel like the film at least presents a long enough storyline where other people can start to like learn and maybe think about things a little differently. Absolutely. And every family is so different, which is what's so challenging. And I think that that's where people struggle is they'll see parts of their family in pieces of the story, but not others. And every family makes different decisions. I think the real burden and the real burden of healing is how to hold compassion for yourself and compassion for the other and not quitting yourself and holding space for the other in a way that's as safe for yourself as possible. That is a very, very thin razor's edge on which to balance. And I think we're always course correcting as we try to do that. And I think that it's really quite an amazing story. I think, Sam, your journey in it in particular, since we get to see you go from childhood into adulthood and have had sort of a lot of the ups and downs with your mother, but it shows us that these things will also continue to evolve. And also, I don't believe you have kids yet, Sam, but you do read. And we talk about how do these cycles end. They end with the, how the next generation of children get parented, that you have a generation of kids who now have parents who are more self-examined, who are who really cultivate attachment and security. And then a new generation of children from this family where it was difficult spring into the world feeling secure and safe in the world and new things happen. So I think that's where it's all of us being self-reflective so we can then do right and doing the work, frankly, and then we can do right by the children we have. We ain't going to get it perfect, but at least at a minimum, we can help our children feel safe. And that's the real legacy that gets paid forward, that if you learn that from Joyce, of that I need to double down on making sure that my own children feel safe, then none of these lessons were in vain and that you really, really took something quite valuable on how you'll move forward and also be able to hold space for her in light of a very complex history. So what I really love about your film, what I really love about your story and how you've told it, is that this isn't about black and white cartoon villain images. This is actually about really robust takes on these stories and everyone is so different. And that if we can always bring an empathic and compassionate lens, but also have that compassion for ourselves, I think rather amazing things can happen, and your film is one of those examples. Do you have any last thoughts or feelings or questions you want to share? I think approaching this movie also with like a, a gendered like lens of if the parental figure gender was swapped, this is a totally different movie, right? And and just like appreciate that the women, the moms, the the matriarchal figures in our life are doing so much of the emotional labor and work and that the story is this big because when that figure disappears, a lot of that's gone. And yeah, I just like, I want to recognize that and make sure that, that, you know, that people are seeing it through that as well. I'm so glad you brought that up, Sam, because I think that that is why the story was so affecting. You're right. If this had been a story about a dad who got up and left, I'm going to be frank with you. 
people have been kind of been like, okay, and show me something new. We much, much more rarely see this this story of a mother leaving, which is actually much more of a cultural taboo, to be quite frank with you. And I think we look, view it through that lens. But also, so the other side of the patriarchy is is the assumptions we make, again, in a gendered lens from the matriarchy and the the sort of, you know, the unrecognized emotional work of, of nourishing children's psyches and developing them into adults disproportionately has and continues to fall on women's shoulders. But again, this story, it's even been explored in stories like The Lost Daughter. I mean, other really compelling films that are taking on this idea of what, what, what happens when the mother goes. And it's a much more demonizing narrative. And I had to catch myself. So the second time I watched it, I thought, I need to look at it through that lens because if Joyce had been a man, I actually don't think the same level of demonization would happen. And I think that's why it's an incredible story. And, and it's, there's so many layers to how we think about this. And for you, Sam, as, and, and to Sam and Reed, both of you as survivors of this, to lose a mother in this way, you had far fewer cultural templates and archetypes to turn to than if you had had your father get up and leave, which I think is actually a more universalized story. Yeah. So to which end, how can people find you, support you? How can people see this film? Because now that we're talking about it, people are going to want to see this. And I cannot recommend this enough. So how can people do this? Ah, uh, The good news is it'll be broadcast nationally on PBS. Oh, great. This May on Independent Lens. And PBS now has a app that, you know, anyone can watch it for free on, you know, whatever device they have. Just get the PBS app. And right now we are doing a film festival tour too. So we'll be in, maybe we'll be in your city. You can look for us on samnowmovie.com and see if uh, we'll be showing up. That's awesome. We'll put that link in the show notes so people can see if it's coming close to them. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Remini. Here are my takeaways from my conversation with Sam and Reed. The road trip metaphor is particularly poignant because it captures the process of growing through complex family relationships. Anyone who has had to unpack this kind of family trauma and loss knows that while we may not literally be getting into a car, it's a mental journey through trying to find answers, disappointments, frustrations, and discovery. Certainly the road trip in the film yielded those kinds of discoveries, but framing it as such for ourselves may give us a tangible metaphor that can help us understand that it's a process. In this next takeaway, keeping secrets is always such a challenging family dynamic, and Sam was put in that position when he got to Long Beach and found his mother. Something so personally powerful and that he knew would profoundly affect his brother and family was something he was being instructed to keep a secret by the person who abandoned him. While many of the secrets that people and families are often instructed to keep as children are not as heavy, secret keeping is a tall and inappropriate order to place on a child, and yet it happens all the time. In this next takeaway, Accountability is so important in a relationship. And even if someone in any kind of close relationship behaves poorly, hearing them take responsibility for it can be quite restorative for the person who is hurt. The dynamic that Sam found himself in, being afraid to ask for accountability from his mother because he was afraid he would scare her away, is a classical dynamic for children in what feel like fragile relationships with parents. Over time, the child can get indoctrinated to believe that accountability is too risky and in adulthood may find themselves in relationships where there is anxiety about needing it or asking for it. In this next takeaway, do we ever get the question of why answered in difficult, narcissistic, or any kind of relationship with someone who does not have self-reflective capacity? Probably not. Understanding our motivations for why we do what we do requires self-awareness, vulnerability, and a dropping of defenses. Not getting a why can make moving forward feel difficult, but one element of certain personality styles is a lack of insight into their own motivations. When healing from these kinds of losses and relationships, a challenging part of the radical acceptance 
is giving up on ever getting the question of why answered. In this next takeaway, trauma, loss, and attachment disruption can play a significant part in the development of narcissism. While understanding this can result in compassion for someone with a narcissistic or antagonistic personality, it can also raise guilt and confusion in survivors. A person's trauma may absolutely explain their challenges with empathy, attachment, and self-awareness. And yet, at the same time, you can still feel hurt by their behavior. Sam's story is such a reminder of how complex these personalities and relationships are. And in our last takeaway, this episode really brings up the role of place in understanding and healing. Sam shares that despite the numerous challenges that his story had, the moment when his mother showed back up at his father's home was unsettling and upside down. For many people who have gone through any kind of relationship characterized by abandonment, lack of empathy, and lack of clarity, you may find that on many days you are moving forward. Then one day you find yourself back in a place, for example, a childhood home or place you lived with someone, and a person can really feel thrown backwards. That sequence with Sam was a reminder of how powerful place and location can be, how it can impact our emotions, and for survivors to be kind to themselves when they have to face the place.